Hello, it's Andrew Eborn here for another edition of the Andrew Eborn Show. And my favourite part of this show is when people write in and ask to come on and tell me about their lives. And one such person is the wonderful Dawn, who last time was telling us about the benefits of chocolate. Well, today she's going to take us through her chocolate factory and show us what she gets up to. How are you, Dawn? Yeah, we're fine here. Thank you, Andrew. It's always, and look at you with your pinny on, you've got your advertising on, you've got chocolate behind you. Tell us what we're going to see today. So what I'm going to do um, now is I'm going to um, show you how we really, if you were to come in here, how you would make your chocolates. I'm when if I want to come in. No, 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 start that again. If I want to come in, when? When I want to come in, that's what when I want. When you come in, yeah, when we're allowed to have people back in again, when we're allowed to get you all in making chocolate again. We're here waiting for you. So yeah, that's what we do. We're here, Fantastic. we allow you in and you just have fun. Have a okay, well, always, I put the fun into dysfunctional, I can tell you, it's always gotta be good. So, okay, so as an experience, and this is the great thing about it, we touched on last time, the health benefits of chocolate, how you can tell the different types and things like that. Maybe if you've got some chocolate there, do you, I presume you do, you can show us the different types from the milk uh, to the white, well, the white to the milk to the dark and talk through those, and then show us some of the molds and the various experiences that we might get when, not if, we come and visit you. Okay, so um, I have got my platter, get my platter of chocolate buttons. I love it, I love it when they have to rush off and get their, <laughs> isn't that a great thing to have? You've got to say, I've got a platter of chocolate buttons. That's chocolate like, buttons. So, oh, that's delish. what we have here, we have three um, main types of chocolate. Obviously our milk, our dark and our white chocolate. So dark chocolate, as I said before, is ground up cocoa beans with a bit of sugar. Milk chocolate is the addition of milk. So black, uh, dark chocolate is a little bit like a black coffee. If you have black coffee, you're tasting the flavor of the coffee beans. With dark chocolate, you're tasting the flavor of the um, cocoa beans. A Little bit of sugar goes in there, and obviously the more sugar that's added, it just gets more sweet. Add milk to that and it goes lighter in color. So that's why milk chocolate is more brown in color. And then white chocolate is, instead of using the whole cocoa bean, if you squeeze a cocoa bean, you can extract butter from it. And so using just the butter from the cocoa bean with milk and sugar gives you white chocolate. So white chocolate is only chocolate if it's made with the cocoa butter from the cocoa bean. And it'll tell you that on the ingredients label. So all the information is there for you. So what we do in our studio, when you come to make your chocolate with us, we have in our machines, these chocolate buttons melted and we get our chocolate buttons from Belgium because in Belgium they've got very strict rules as to what's allowed to go into chocolate. So that's why we get it from Belgium. And then we melt it in our machines. So I will take you over now to our chocolate machines. So here you can see these two chocolate machines are not turned on at the moment because these hold up to 100 kilos of chocolate. Now, we're not using those quantities at the moment because, as I said, we're not able to host any workshops. So what we have over here are three little machines that we do have in here, our milk, our white and our dark chocolate. So we've got our white chocolate in here. Um, this is turned off at the moment, so you can see there's no heat on the back. This is our dark chocolate, which I'm going to work with today. And what we do is we put the chocolate buttons in and it's like a big warm sink. So if I show you the milk chocolate machine here in the corner, that's turned on. You can see the temperature up here is about 40, just over 40 degrees. Um, and as I said to you earlier, chocolate melts at 36 degrees. So we melt it just a little bit warmer than that, fill it with chocolate buttons. And then once it's melted and up to temperature, we then start the wheel. So the wheel is now turning and that starts mixing the chocolate. Fantastic. And then we put on... The, uh, you talk about the melting. Is that, is that true of white, dark and milk chocolate? That it's the same temperature, 36 degrees, is that right? Yeah, so they all melt at the same temperature, but dark chocolate works at around 33 to 34 degrees. If we were using the white chocolate, we'd bring it down to around 30, 30 to 31 degrees. 
and if we were working with the milk chocolate we would bring it down to around a working temperature of between sort of 31 and 32 degrees so what i've done is i've cooked, turned the temperature down from its melting point at 40 we had it melting at 40 degrees and i've turned it down and i've thrown in more chocolate buttons and that's adding the crystals. So we've seeded it with crystals, we've added it in. And as we've added it in, and we've turned the temperature down now to 33.5 degrees, that chocolate has cooled down, the mixing process has helped to cool it. And now we have this chocolate down to a 33.5 degrees, which is now a working temperature, that we can collect the chocolate from the machine and use and put into our chocolate molds. So I'm just going to pop the laptop down because I want to show you what we do, if I can get that on screen. So here's the chocolate machine and what we now do is we put this little cup onto the wheel because rather than collecting our chocolate and scooping out the, the bowl and then having a jug dripping, if we sit this very clever contraption over the wheel, then the chocolate, as you see, comes up on the wheel, it's forced into this collecting cup, and then it's forced out the spout. So now we have chocolate on tap. Fantastic. Chocolate on tap. And now tap. that's ready. That's everybody wants chocolate on tap. <laughs> chocolate on tap. <laughs> so now that's ready for us to collect and put into our moulds. Um, so in these machines are our three chocolates we work with in our classes. Very often we will use a uh, caramel, we have caramel buttons, and the new ruby which is um, a white chocolate but made with pink cocoa beans. Ruby, 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 how we love them, pink cocoa beans? Yes. Where do we get those from? They are very, um, well all cocoa comes from around the equatorial region but very um, only probably about 5% of the world has these pink cocoa beans. Um, so mainly sort of Colombia, um, certain regions grow them. And then when harvested and, and fermented properly or in, in a different way to normal, they can preserve the color of the pink cocoa beans. And so when your white chocolate is made, they're pink and they taste actually very fruity. Oh, how fantastic. And do they have uh, additional benefits because they're pink? Um, I don't think so. Not so much, actually, because being in a white chocolate, you've eliminated some of the cocoa solids. So there you've got the milks and the, um, it's mainly made with the cocoa butters, but it's, it's a lovely flavour. It's like, um, like a wild berry flavour. It gives you sort of a juiciness to it. Um, but mainly the cocoa benefits come in your very dark chocolates where you've got the high levels of your your cocos in there, the antioxidant levels. And also what I didn't say earlier was the fact that if you eat um, a little bit of dark chocolate or high cocoa content chocolate, it gives you that feel good factor. So it gives you that, and it's the um, flavanols that are in there, release endorphins. And it gives you that feel good factor and that nice, it's not, not a high that you get from sugar, it's not that sugar rush. Um, so that's one thing I was gonna say actually, the um, myth that chocolate is addictive. Can I break the news and tell you that it isn't? Because what is addictive in chocolate is sugar. So if you're eating sugar, a bar of mainly sugar-based confectionery, then half an hour later you want more and the craving you feel is for chocolate, but actually it's for the sugar. So a little bit of very high cocoa content chocolate and actually it's quite satisfying, so. It, it certainly is, and you find a square of that dark chocolate is sometimes all you need, even though I adore chocolate, the higher the cocoa content, the less you need of it to give you yeah. that kick. Isn't that right? That's it. Yeah, absolutely. And so going on to that, then you've got most of your chocolate is a blend. So you buy a brand and because you like the flavour, what they've done is they've blended cocoa beans to get a, a brand, a, a flavour profile in your chocolate. But now what you're finding and the same with um, coffee you're finding you can buy within a brand, you can find their products made with origin sources. So beans from specific regions, specific countries. And so whilst we don't use them so readily in our workshops here, we do um, make chocolate, we get smaller quantities of um, chocolate made with those origin beans. And we turn them into little bars and we do actually tastings, chocolate tastings, a bit like wine tastings. And here we have um, six of um, different origins. So they're all dark chocolate. 
they're all, um, and what you'll find on labels um, and in the, the shops as well, you'll find it'll tell you the origin, so where the beans came from, so whether it's Colombia, Peru, Uganda, all along the equatorial line, and um, it'll tell you how much cocoa is in each of those products, and then it'll tell you the flavour profile. Now that flavour profile is of the beans themselves. It's not a flavour that us as chocolatiers have added. It's naturally in there, like you get with grapes, um, with your wine. So here I've got them as high as 85% cocoa, right down to a 64% Peruvian. Now that's not necessarily to say that that Peruvian being a 64% is a lesser quality than a 70% cocoa because you might have a poorly blended 70% cocoa chocolate but with the Peruvian beans um, having been sourced from Peru as we've talked about um, before um, fantastic uh, cocoa growing area region there and um, and here you've got um, that they tend to put the amount of cocoa in to complement um, the flavor of the beans so my Costa Rican one here 64% again but actually one of the strongest um, flavours um, of all of the um, ones that I've got here. So it's all to do with the beans themselves and the blending uh, and the um, origins, their origins. Oh, fantastic. And what we're going to do, because this is what I love, I love having regular guests on here who tantalisingly give us little tidbits as they go along. We talk about secrets. I mean, the secret, and it's a great secret to reveal, is that chocolate is not addictive and it's really good for you. And I love that. In the same way as I had an expert from the, what, the world of wine, I had uh, my grand friend Theo uh, Philippe came on from Corsica, and he was telling us how good red wine is for you and that sort of side, and how that, if you combine red wine and chocolate and the different pairings. So in later episodes, we will be doing pairings. I think you're going to be a regular guest here. I, I like regular guests, on. This is good. <laughs> okay, that, that sounds good to me. <laughs> Fantastic. So talk us through. So that's the different tastings. We've, we've worked out what the white uh, one is from the, from the cocoa butter. We've worked out what the white chocolate is, and we worked out about the dark chocolate. We've worked out how you get the different wheels, and now you've got a wonderful chocolate on tap. What happens next? So once the chocolate is at its temperature ready to work with, then we have our chocolate mold. You're deciding what you're going to make. And obviously within our workshops, we would have pre, um, people coming would pre know what they're going to make, whether it's as I say, a seasonal uh, workshop, whether they're going to make hollow chocolates, what we're making. But what I've done today is I've got just a selection of molds out to show you the different, and um, some of the different ways of making chocolate. Now the thing about using um, chocolate molds, here we use professional polycarbonate molds and, and they're professional just mainly because they are hard wearing. So they're robust, you can use them over and over again. They tend to come out of the machines that I use here. I use them because when people come in, they can see the chocolate, it's very visual. Um, but today you can, a lot of the um, manufacturing plants, they use more enclosed machines, um, more where they sort of, when I say on tap, they literally are on tap, so you press a pedal and it's dispatched from a tap. So we're using these machines, but these machines as well can have attachments to them. And you can have conveyor belts attached and those conveyor belts, these molds fit onto and so they're, um, fed along on a conveyor belt through the machine but we do everything by hand here and I think that's the beauty of making things in small batches and by hand and, and being quite tactile in, in making it so we use these molds but if you're working from home there's no reason why you can't use other molds things like silicon molds rubber molds and plastic the main two things to consider is a that they are flexible so to get your chocolate out, it needs a little twist. Now these polycarbonate molds don't appear to be very flexible. They're just, they are flexible enough, but rubber molds, silicon molds um, are suitable because they have the give and you can just pop your chocolate out. And the other thing that's quite important, second to being flexible, is the fact that if you want to shine on your product, you need a shine in the mold. So the polycarbonate molds here have got a gloss to them. They've got a sheen. But some of the um, poly, uh, rubber moulds and some of the silicon moulds you can buy, whilst you, they will form your chocolates nicely, you may not get a, sh a sheen to them if there isn't a lacquered surface on the inside of your mould. 
So, you know, you can use them, but if you're not getting that sheen, it's nothing you're doing wrong. It's just to do with the fact that the, the mold, the surface you're putting your chocolates against isn't giving that, that nice shine to your chocolates. So. Fantastic. And, and what I love about some of these molds are very, very old, but you can get some really unusual ones. You can create, and I don't know if you do this, but you can create your own molds. I know a lot of model makers, people have worked on some of the, the major movie franchises. And they're such talented artists. They can create the wonderful molds because you can mold chocolate into anything. It's just a, it's like having clay, if you like, isn't it? You can That's do it. that. What's the most unusual thing you've made out of chocolate? Um, what's the most unusual thing? I'm just looking around to see if I've got it here on the shelf. Ah, yes. I'll take you over to my shelf. It's, it's ah, really it. old it's now. Journey. I like this travel. <laughs> This is most <laughs> so, so here on the top shelf, which is our top shelf, <laughs> hey, this look is what we could do. More chocolate <laughs> secrets on the top shelf. I hope there's nothing naughty up there. <laughs> no, no not, not on the top shelf here. <laughs> it's under the counter here. <laughs> but um, so this is one of our little um, workshops that we do. So it's our haunted houses. And here we use, where are we going? There we go. Here we use a mold and we freehand make all the little bits that stick onto it. So the little ghosts and the ghoulies. And at Christmas, obviously, we change those for Father Christmas and snowmen. Um, um, so that's part freehand, part mold. But what I've got over here, I was commissioned about eight years ago to make a birthday gift for a gentleman in his 80s. And he loved underwater. So I'm just trying to see here is um, the pieces that I had left over, I put into a little um, table centre. The one that I made for him was about 14 inches across, so quite a large um, display. And so this here is just some of the pieces. And of course, over the years, it's got moved around, it's got warm, it's got, it's, it's sort of, started to give a bit but you can see I made the, the some of them are molded so the fish here are molded in fact this is what I'm going to show you how to make in the moment and then some of these are uh, transfer sheets and freehand so so yeah that's that sort of thing these are again some of our Easter themed I'm trying to see the screen and see what I'm showing you there's our haunted houses um, and Christmas cottages oh did I tell you I like Lionel Richie? I, I don't think you needed to tell us. And I was going to say reveal a secret, but everybody knows. Even Lionel knows that you love him. I was speaking to him <laughs> earlier. He said, tell Dawn that I love her too. <laughs> so there's some pictures at the top there. Oh, Lionel. So, yeah. You can also do, can't you, Dawn? Because I've done this. I've been along to events where the chocolate is, they, have, they can mould your actual head in 3D, can't they? Now that's the thing, yes, so moulding chocolate, you can mould chocolate in a mould, so liquid chocolate poured into a mould that's going to give you um, different shapes, as I'm going to show you this morning, and you can also freeform um, chocolate in terms of pouring it um, over different shapes. So if you have, for instance, um, a toilet roll or a drain pipe, you can pour chocolate over that and leave it to set, and then you can do freeform moulds and freeformed shapes. And as you say, you can mould it. Um, there you would have your chocolate, but you'd have to mix something into it. Um, something like a glucose syrup, something to make it more a modelling paste. Um, and then you can mould it and you can form it, like you say, like a, like a clay. Well, no, fantastic. It's, it's rather like bread. I mean, bread is moulded and you have these competitions where they can make all these glorious structures uh, from an artistic point of view. But that bread, because it tends to be a bit harder, tends not to be edible. With all the chocolate moulds, it is edible, isn't it? Most of it is, yes. So I don't know. I think in one of our other interviews, you were talking about um, Salon du Chocolat, which is um, in, based in, uh, the, uh, in Paris. Now, that is an exhibition. So that happens every year, um, usually around October, November time. And one year it concentrates on patisserie work. And the second year it will concentrate on chocolatiers uh, work. And then what happens is you have chocolatiers from all over the world that will be competing um, one year in their own country to win the title to be chief chocolatier. And then the next year they will all go to Le Sa uh, Salon du Chocolat in Paris and they will compete and you should see what they create. I mean, it's amazing. They have to create 
completely out of chocolate, a, a statue similar to what I showed you over there, but it must be a minimum of a metre tall and no more than two metres tall. Well, that's and my height. Been... We, can, we can have a statue of me. I'm one yeah, metre absolutely. 91. <laughs> no, this will be perfect. The Andrew Yvonne show with a one metre 91. I could win the Sha uh, Salon du Chocolat in Paris, because I go to Paris many, many times a, a day almost. <laughs> Um, that would be super. So the Andrew Eborn Challenge, and what I love. So what do they win? What do they win if they if they win that competition? It, it's to get the title. It's to get the title of World Master Chocolatier. Oh come on! I love that. But what I also love is that in the Oscars, you get the Oscars. You know that sort of thing. Yes. I think in the Salon du Chocolat, the competition, they should win a Charlie, shouldn't they? Charlie, yeah, Charlie would be good. I, I, a gold I, I, Charlie. Factory, this is what you've got to win, you know. It's got to be good. I will suggest it to them. It was an inspiration today. <laughs> you win. You're an Andrew Evil, 1 metre 91. That's in the rules. And you could win a Charlie. I love that. <laughs> that sounds really good. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. So, okay, so we're going to go on to the pouring now. So you can do the moulds, but we basically worked out different ways of creating the moulds, and you get lots of people in the same ways. We have Madame Tussauds, I'm pointing over there, because it's literally next door to us in Regent's Park. Um, you've got the different moulds that you can do, and basically if you can mould anything, you can mould yep. it in chocolate. Chocolate is incredibly versatile, not just in terms of flavours, which we'll come on to, but in terms of the mould. So we come along to you, which we're going to do, and you're going to take us through some of the moulds. You've shown us the pouring, you've talked through the chocolates and so on and so forth. You've shown some of the glorious creations. What would we do next? So you would have selected your moulds. We have around 200 moulds um, and we sort those into categories. So it may be that you're making, as I said, some individual little bite-sized chocolates. It may be you're doing your filled chocolates. Now if you're doing filled chocolates, we need deeper cavities. So we'd have sorted those and then you would, you would choose your moulds. Um, and then we would take you through the process. So um, if you're going to do um, just solid chocolates, here I've selected a little fish mold. Let me turn it around that way. So there you can see the little fish, the little Nemo's if you like. Oh no, Nemo's on the license and as an intellectual property lawyer, I'll be stamping down, you can't do Nemo's unless you've got a license. <laughs> I just <laughs> called them Nemo's. Like Nemo's. Other fish are available. <laughs> so Other say, fish are available. Not the place for Nemo's. <laughs> But we've got these ones and then we also have goldfish as well. So we just, oh. we've got a name for all these different moulds. So this is what we call our Nemo's. So this is, this is this one. And then what we would do, we would say to our um, clients, and of course we would have our milk white and dark machines on. I would say to them, right, what would you like to fill it with? Choose your chocolate. And um, then they would go over to the machines and they would collect their chocolates. I'm just going to turn it round. And we would simply go over to the machine and fill up our jug. Fantastic. So that's easy. So you've got your little pouring thing. We've got chocolate on tap. You've got your jug. Everybody goes over. They've all got their aprons on. They've all washed their hands appropriately. Really sanitary. Not even touching the chocolate. Not touching each other. So we can work that's out. That. And, that sort of and stuff. then you've got that lovely liquid chocolate in the jug. Oh, and then oh. with a steady hand, we are going to pour it into the centre of each of our cavities. Now at this stage, we're not too worried if we haven't got chocolate right to the edge of each cavity. We're simply estimating how much is needed in each one. So we're just going along. We have to work fairly quickly here because the chocolate all the time it's in the machine is being held at its um, workable temperature. But the minute we've moved it away, of course it's cooling down now and we know that in the coolness and um, the chocolate starts to set now dark chocolate sets the quickest it's because of the amount of cocoa solids that we have in there so i'm going to bring this now so you can see i poured the chocolate in there um, it's a bit lumpy bumpy so you can see it's sort of you know quite undulating there and we've still got gaps so what we do now in fact i'm going to leave you there i'm not going to take you over with me because this is a noisy process I'm going to turn it round and I'm going to go over to my machine over here and attached to our big machine, we've got a vibrating plate and we're going to put this on it and it's going to shape the chocolate flat and into all the nooks and crannies. Oh, fantastic. We love vibrating plates getting into those nooks and crannies. Fantastic. Here we go. Shaking the chocolate. Oh, it's, it's quite quiet, actually, Dawn. It's not that noisy, your vibrating plate. Thank you. I'll come back. 
There you go. Okay, we can have a look at that. So you leave it on that vibrating plate. Got to switch it on. And that, one, that was quick. That didn't take long at all. Yeah, we'll probably give it another sort of 30 seconds or so. But having shaken that now, it shakes the chocolate down into the cavities. What I would do as well as it's shaking is if one, for instance, is overflowing, then we would smooth it down. If one didn't have enough, we would top it up. So we'd sort of pay attention to it over there, making sure that they were all nice and full. Um, and also the, the vibrating gets rid of air bubbles. So it eliminates air bubbles and it makes sure that if you've got quite a detailed mold, the chocolate is vibrated into all the little nooks and crannies of the mold. And when we're happy with that mold, that it's got um, enough chocolate in and they're all, all um, filled, we then put it into the fridge. Now, of course, this is quite, um, if you were making chocolate, for instance, to sell and you were bagging this up, it's quite important to get these all uniformly um, filled because otherwise, if you're putting, say, seven in a bag, the weights are going to vary. So these moulds are pretty much um, made so that it helps when you're um, doing things by weight. Um, and when you freehand, which is what we do, we pour everything freehand, that's when you get things that are a little bit, you know, you may not get the chocolate into the corner or you may get them a little bit more full. And that's just the beauty of, of, of you know, artisan chocolates. So this goes into the fridge. I'm just going to pop that in. Fantastic. We love all of that. So if people don't have a vibrating machine at home, and I'm not sure that everybody does, um, I presume you could just gently shake it from side to side to make sure you get those nooks and crannies. Yeah, so what you could do, if you haven't got a vibrating plate at home, what we do is we just put it on the table, just give it a few taps, taps drop it a couple of times, and then that just, just shakes it in. That's right. Um, so that those um, chocolates, when they come out, they're going to be... Um, solid chocolate and obviously on the back of them it will be smooth and when we tip them out they will have the detail on the other side. What we've got here is two identical moulds but they're actually a mirror image of each other and these are dolphins so if we fill both sides we can then put them together and then we can create a double-sided so a 3D chocolate where it's um, on both sides not just and flat one side with the shape there. So again, what we do is we fill the chocolate. I'm just going to get a bit more chocolate. Always worthwhile. We're never going to object to a little bit more chocolate. So I love all of that. Okay, so here comes the chocolate. You've got and then we're going to fill them both. As you say, you've got to move fairly quickly so that the chocolate doesn't uh, get hard again. That's right. Dark chocolate is, the, I think, the best to work with. Um, I love working with it. It's so glossy and shiny, um, and I love the flavour of it as well. But also, as you say, you do have to work quickly with it because um, it sets quite quickly. And at different times of the year, so we've just had some really hot days, um, and we've got a very nice studio here. We call it a cool studio. We've got a very cool studio. So um, we worked at around 20 degrees. Um, however, in, in the summer, 20 degrees can feel quite warm. And in the winter, 20 degrees can feel quite chilly. So in, in the winter time, pouring this would actually set quite quickly. Whereas in the summer months, when everything generally is a bit warmer, um, the air temperature is a bit warmer as well, the chocolate itself is a bit warmer. Um, it just takes a, a bit longer to uh, to work so again i've given those um put, put the chocolate in i'm going to get them quickly shaking over, there. over to the vibrating plate <laughs> it's rather fun there you go and then what i'm going to do whilst they're shaking i'm going to use my scraper to smooth them down okay that's just taking the top off so it makes them all nice and flat and easy so that the two molds can go together uh, beautifully, because I guess that's the real secret as well. I was going to ask you is when you put the two together, sometimes you can never see the join. And I'm sure there's a particular skill to that as well. So we can have a look as the two come together. Uh, here they come. We're going to bring them over. So as I say, if you don't have a vibrating plate at home, what you can do, you can bang it gently on the table to make sure you get to those little nooks and crannies. So you get that superbly smooth thing. Here we go. Let's have a look at these. So I've smoothed them down, taken off the excess, and now I've got to sandwich them together. I've got to make sure that I've got them the right way round so they go together rather than upside down as so we have upside down dolphins. So I'm going to turn that round like that. 
And then I'm going to go one, two, three, flip it over, push it together. And then we have these little connecting pins and they just go into the mold. And then they just make sure that it's locked together so that they're not, when the, when the molds are together, they don't twist. Just push it together. And then that can go into the fridge again. Now, because Alice is double thickness, usually your chocolate takes about 20 minutes to set in a fridge. Um, but this one, because um, you've got it double thickness here, it may take a little bit longer. Um, now, you're saying about um, you can make anything with chocolate as long as you've got a mould. You don't want to make anything too thick because do you remember I said to you it has to cool within the right temperature? And if the chocolate doesn't cool quick enough, then it starts to bloom. So if you've got anything, any chocolate um, that's very solid, then the coolness isn't going to penetrate into the inside. And so very often, if you do buy chocolate that's quite solid, the inside, you may get a small bloom on the inside. And that's because the cold just hasn't got right inside. And again, it's not, it's not harmful to you. No, but fascinating. So, so what is the ideal thickness then? I mean, have you tested that in terms of how thick the chocolate should be when people are thinking of their Well, mold? I would say most of your um, sort of bite size, that sort of size chocolate, if you think about it, um, things like, say, a Yorkie bar, that sort of chunkiness. Um, other chocolate bars are available. Other chocolate bars are available, absolutely, including mine. So this sort of size here... Um, can you see where you where you can break it and you've got your chunks there, that sort of thing. Um, most chocolates, the chocolates that you buy in boxes, they're around 30 millimetres deep and 30 millimetres wide. So that sort of size. If you go much bigger than that, because the other thing as well is if you go much bigger than that to bite into chocolate, it's a solid object and you're probably not going to do your teeth any good biting into something that solid. So I'm going to put our dolphins in the fridge. And then oh, I'll those of you who've just tuned in, they're not real dolphins. They'll, I'll have all <laughs> people complaining. We're going to put our dolphins in the fridge. <laughs> but what we love is if you've just joined us, learning how to become chocolatiers. One of my favourite topics. It's got to be good. It's going to plug us back in. Okay, so now, before we um, filled those moulds with chocolate, what we could have done is if I had, say, the white chocolate machine working, I could have um, drizzled some white chocolate in first, let that dry for a few seconds, and then filled it with dark. And that would have given you, um, when you tip them out, a dark chocolate, but with white decoration on. The other way is these very, very clever moulds that have got a false bottom. Ooh. So the bottom... Now we're talking... Look at his eyes light up. <laughs> so you just pop that out and now you can see through the mold and now into that mold on the bottom you can lay a transfer sheet these are um, pre-printed sheets with patterns made out of cocoa butter colored cocoa butter so they're all edible and if you just lie them in the mold like that if I turn it around, that's the bottom. And then if you look inside the mold, you can see the patterns there. Then we're gonna put the lid back on, or the base, because these are mag magnified. So there's magnets in the mold. I put the, the, the base back in, and now you've got your patterns in the bottom. So I can fill that with chocolate, and then when I tip them out, that pattern is going to be on the top and you're going to have pretty pictures on the top. So I'm going to do the same now. I'm just going to fill them with chocolate and put them into the fridge. Um, and what I actually did, I thought ahead and I have already done a batch of each of these. Is this your blue Peter moment? Are you I was going to, use going to say yes. <laughs> We're going to go to Dawn. Wait a moment, Dawn. <laughs> Is there one you prepared earlier? I've got one I prepared earlier. So I will go to the fridge and I'll get it out. And oh. I will show you what happens once your chocolate has set. Fantastic. Let's have a look at that. Well, how exciting is this? 
we love it. And you can do all of this yourself. So what's really wonderful, apart from trying some things at home, top of experiences uh, with Dawn, if you happen to live near my birthplace, well, not my birthplace, when I moved down from about the age of seven down to Bracklesham Bay and Chichester area. So if you happen to be there, you can go and visit Dawn, which would be wonderful. But here is one we prepared earlier. Let's have a look. Now, what I'm going to show you is, you can see, this is the one I just put in. Can you see how dark that is? Well, it is quite dark. And it's got a reddish hue about it, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. Yes, dark chocolate. When it's um, liquid and, and quite warm, it's got a reddish hue, hue about it and actually can look quite milky as well. Now, that's the one that I've just put in the fridge. This is the one I did earlier. No, can you see? The chocolate that's... inside has set and it's contracted away from the mould. So that's what we're looking for to understand when our chocolate is set. So I'm just going to put this one back in. And how long, Dawn, does it normally take to get to that stage? About 20 minutes, is that right? Sorry, how? How long does it normally take? About 20 minutes? Yeah, 20 minutes, I would say, for our little fish that we did, because obviously they're thinner. So you've just got a single level there. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give a little twist to the mould and then I'm going to tip it out. And ideally, as you turn it over, they just come out. Gentle little tap. They've all come out. And so now you've got your little shapes formed. Your fish. Don't they look absolutely delicious? Absolutely. Now, can you see that shine there? Yes, I can see a shiny fish. So that shine is a combination of the fact that the chocolate was tempered. It was the right temperature when it went into the fridge. Um, and of course, a combination that you have that sheen in the mould. And that's what gives you that contraction and that lovely shine on your chocolates when they come out. So it's a bit like getting ice cubes out of an ice cube tray, just a little bit of a twist and then they come out. Now, ideally you don't want to handle these in the first sort of 20 minutes that they're out of the fridge because that's the time that they are still just coming up to room temperature and they're more susceptible to your warm fingers and you can get finger marks on them. So ideally decant them onto a tray and leave them. And then when you do handle your chocolate, if you have a cotton glove, that's um, the best thing because then it, it not only doesn't um, put fingerprints on your chocolate, um, obviously for hygiene reasons as well, but it does and it allows you to hold your chocolate a little bit longer without your warm fingers um, marking your chocolate. So those are the little fish. And if we did our dolphins, so here we have to take the pin out of the mold. Again, a little twist separate the mould to take the top lid off. Now you can see we've got some in this half and just a little tap there, a little tap here and now we have got, I'm going to hold them up for you, it's easier to see, our Dolphin. So you've got your... You look sweet. Fantastic. And is there a way, I know we've got that sort of connecting bit where they do that, is there a way, so sometimes they're so smooth in the middle that you can't tell the joy. How would you do that? Uh, so it's probably to do, I mean, this is, this is probably slightly smoother. It depends on the viscosity of the chocolate. Um, because if it's quite thick when you put it in, then it's not going to adhere. Or if you underfill a mould, then sometimes you get air bubbles in it, so you get little gaps. So it's all to do with um, with the with um, the viscosity of the chocolate and pouring it in. Um, that one there, I can see there's a gap through it. Uh, if I turn it around that way, you've got a bit of it. Can you see the air? The, the yeah, gap runs through it. It's a holy dolphin. It's a holy, holy one. So that one probably, um, I, either I didn't push the mould together properly in the middle or there was a thicker lump of chocolate. Perhaps it had cooled too quickly. 
Um, the other thing I you can reckon, do, you have... Dawn, I reckon, as a top tip from Andrew Eborn from Octopus TV, I'm going to revolutionise chocolate now because I reckon that that vibrating plate is not used often enough. And I reckon if you do that when the two things are connected and you vibrate it, you will close up the gap a little bit more. Do you reckon that would work? You can do. Yeah, you can do that. Um, and the other thing you can do as well is if you only put chocolate into one half and then you put the other half on empty and then you rotate it, the chocolate lines the mould and that's how you get a hollow chocolate. Ah, fantastic stuff. And the other thing, so that's great about hollow chocolate. I love that. The other thing I was going to ask is how you then fill it with stuff. Because so, often people have a wonderful fondant inside or they have something glorious. How do you fill it? So what you would do is you would fill your hollow cavity. And again, you would choose one that's a depth to it. And then once you've filled it, before you put it in the fridge, before it solidifies, you tip it out. And you tip all the liquid out. Now tipping that liquid out actually leaves a coating on the inside. So you end up with a hollow shell. And then you put that in the fridge just to set that chocolate shell. And then you pipe in your soft center. And to about three quarters full. And then once you pipe the fillings in, then again, you leave those to chill and to set. And then you top them up with chocolate and you sort of um, skim chocolate over the back of them to seal them. And then when you tip them out, you have your hollow, your, your filled centered, if you like. Fantastic. Now, I love all this. This has been such a delight. So wonderful. So <laughs> people come along. So when they come along and see you, and, and we talked about it being my, near my hometown, near Chichester, Brackleshin Bay, uh, what we love about it, they will get to do all of this. Uh, they can eat as they go along. Do you eat much chocolate in a day yourself? Uh, well, I tend to, when I'm tempering the machines in the morning, I'll have a few dark chocolate buttons. But I think the thing is, a lot of it is, because it's here, I know it's here. If I was told, that's it, you mustn't touch anything, I think it's a sort of, then you want to, don't you? But I think, because I know it's here, I know at any time I could eat it if I wanted to. So I tend not to. But if we're making, so yesterday we were doing a big corporate order and we were doing um, strawberries and cream. So we were doing our soft filled chocolates with the strawberry filling in and so you know we had a few few accidents there so they just had to be eaten <laughs> no, I, I understand that no it's an accident hoping to happen not waiting to happen we're hoping for those accidents well that's the funny thing is i remember when i used to go uh we used to have lots of places where you had your pick your own all round brackleshin and witterings and that sort of thing yeah. the fields. and you used to go strawberries and glorious things like that raspberries and i always remember that you when you're wandering around the fields, you eat your body weight in them and you end up with a little bag which you get weighed and you pay your tuppence and take me. But your body is massively <laughs> increased as a result of you being eating around them. So I love all of that. I would love that sort of chocolate thing. So anybody who comes and visits, they will get that whole experience. They will then go home with what they make. Is that right? Absolutely. So, of course, once so on, the, on the table, whilst they're working, we put platters of the buttons out so they can eat their, those chocolate buttons. Um, and actually, it's amazing how many people, when they go, they say, I just never thought I couldn't eat any more chocolate. Because it is, as, you know, as we've said, quite satisfying. So the buttons are there, but they do get to take everything they make themselves then home. So we give them, once they've taken their chocolates out, we give them little boxes, little bags with lovely ribbons to tie them all up. Um, it may be that they, make, they want to make lots of little gifts for people. So it may be that we're doing a Christmas workshop where they're coming to make their Christmas presents. Um, it may be they're making a particular Easter egg for nanny or auntie or, or whatever. So, um, yes, yeah, so they can choose how they want to wrap them up and we provide. And that's the other important thing, actually, which we haven't discussed, is packaging for chocolate. Now, I said to you that, um, well, in chocolate, the bean itself, half of that cocoa bean is butter. It's made up of cocoa butter. And it's that butter that absorbs, when the, when the pod is on the tree, it's the butter that absorbs all the flavors. So where your pod is growing, all the flavors are absorbed, whether it's roses, whether it's citrus trees nearby, smokiness in the air. It's the cocoa butter in the cocoa bean that absorbs those flavors. So that gives you the flavor profile of your cocoa beans. And then as they're manufactured into chocolate, we can then further add flavors. But the whole time, 
that butter that's in there is absorbing any flavor it comes in contact with. So when the beans are laid out to dry, they may be laid out on a canvas surface or a canvas table, or they may be dried on a farmer's patio on, on a tarmac surface. The whole time that cocoa butter is absorbing the flavor of whatever it touches, right up until it's in my studio, until it's in your products that you have at home, and the whole time it's absorbing that. So the packaging generally that you buy your chocolate in, it's best to keep it in that, because hopefully that chocolate, that packaging is tried and tested. Not only is it food safe, but it should also be chocolate friendly. Because we found that by putting chocolate into, say um, you buy these plastic ro uh, rolls of plastic sandwich bags, and if we had some jug scrapings or some mismatches or whatever, we would put them in these sandwich bags and just take them home. But by the time we got home with them, within a few hours, the chocolate was tasting of plastic. So it's that cocoa butter that takes on, it's very delicate and takes on the flavors of everything around it. So ideally, if you buy chocolate, keep it in the packaging it came in and that will preserve it. If you then want to put it in an airtight container or a tin, that's fine, but keep it in the packaging. Don't decant it into another container because there's the chance that that will then influence the flavor of your, of your chocolate. Fantastic. I love these top tips. You know, there's no, there's no messing here either. Fantastic. And the other thing which you do, and I, I touched on with other chocolatiers as well, is all the different flavors that you can put into chocolate because it's just limited by your own imagination, isn't it? Some fantastic flavors. Talk us through some of those. So when it's, um, it's limited by your own imagination, but what it is limited to is water-based ingredients. So you don't want to be using those. So if you've just got a jug of liquid chocolate, into that you can add anything that is a dry base. So for instance, dry powders, so chili powders, nutmeg powders, cinnamon powders, they are dry, they, there's no water activity. So you can add those in and you can mix them into your chocolate, so you can flavour your chocolate with herbs and spices that way. You can of course add um, whole fruits and nuts, so again dry ingredient. Ingredients, so perhaps you then would want to have your chocolates made and before you put them in the fridge, perhaps put in the, the whole ingredients or put the whole ingredients into your mould and pour the chocolate over the back of them. Because those ingredients are dried, they're fine. You can use fresh fruit, but if you use fresh fruit, you'd have to probably eat it that same day because of course fresh fruit has got um, natural um, oil uh, juices in there and water-based so what would happen there, the water would affect the chocolate and you'd get this bloom and then you'd have to eat it fresh. If you're going to add a liquid flavour to your liquid chocolate, it has to be an oil-based flavour. Now, I would then say what we use is pure essential oils because A, then they're pure, they give a really true flavour. You need very little of them to give a really true flavour. If you're in the supermarkets and you're buying their liquid flavourings, very often they're water-based, glycerol-based, or they're vegetable oil-based. Now, whilst you can um, put a vegetable oil into chocolate, it's not going to affect the makeup of the chocolate. It will obviously affect the flavour. So do you really want to be using vegetable um, oils that have been flavored with orange um, and then add it into your chocolate? And because they're flavored oils, you're gonna need a lot more. So ideally, if you can get hold of pure oils, make sure they're um, culinary oils, so used for cooking, not for aromatherapy. Um, not that those aromatherapy oils are gonna hurt you, it's just the fact that the way that aromatherapy oils are made and things for air fresheners and candles, they're not made in a food, um, hygiene rated kitchen so um, ideally you want them the, those oils but they're that they're made for culinary reasons so well, fantastic but again experiment but with the dry side as you say to make that make sense now the other thing that people have always talked about is having a chocolate bath have you ever had one of those <laughs> it's the love well not intentionally <laughs> no i mean 
Yeah, no, you always said, let me grab it. Stay there, I'm gonna grab it. I, I'm not going anywhere. Are you gonna grab yeah. a topic <laughs> off? Show us one of these things. So this is what I love about it, is that so many questions, people write in all the time and say, look, they wanna find out about things. We bring on the world's experts to talk about it. And here we're finding about everything chocolate. What have we got here, Dawn? So what we have is the pod. In the pod, you have the beans, like the little core inside. And so those beans are roasted, they're like little kidney beans. Now I've said um, before and earlier in this interview that that cocoa bean, if ground up whole, that makes your dark chocolate, add milk to it, milk chocolate, with a bit of sugar. If you press that, 50% of that cocoa bean is butter. So if you press the cocoa bean and squeeze out the butter, that's cocoa butter, um, and add milk to that and sugar to that because you white chocolate, but that's what makes your chocolate melt. Now holding that, that melts. This is the base of a lot of your body lotions and your body moisturizers. So that butter is ideal and good for the skin to rub in and to, and that's what you'll find. So in terms of having a bath in chocolate, not really the dark chocolate, but most of your body products you're applying to the skin are made of cocoa butter. So and that's... you often see that on the ingredients, don't you? See the cocoa butter. And again, mm -hmm. I presume it has the same nutritional values as uh, you, you get the endorphins going when you, when you eat it. Uh, what, are the, what are the benefits of cocoa butter? Um, I don't know that they've got the full... I think to get the full benefits, you need the whole, the whole bean. You need the whole um, the, the, of the, the powder. Because once you've taken the butter out, then what's left, the other 50% is a dry mass. So that's ground up. That's how you get cocoa powder. Do you know your cocoa powder to make your um, hot chocolates? So that's how you obtain cocoa butter. It's the fat that's been reduced from the cocoa bean to give you the dry mass. So I would say really the best thing is for, to have these both together in your high cocoa contents. I'm not sure the actual breakdown, once you start separating them, um, this is the fat part um, there. Now, the good thing about this is you can buy it, we stock it, in its powdered form. Now the good thing here, it's um, known as a noble fat, so you can cook with it. And in its powdered form, if you baste your meat and your veg or your fish with it, even mixed up with spices, um, then you can cook with it and it actually reduces the calorific value quite significantly than using other oils. So it can reduce the calorific value by your frying and your cooking by up to 70%. What it does, it also holds in the um, natural juices and that natural flavours. So the benefits of cocoa butter is really when it comes to, if you want to use it for body moisturisers, and, and for cooking, that's there. And it doesn't um, affect your cholesterol levels because the fats that are in there are not the bad fats. Uh, we love it. So there's lots and lots and lots of secrets. We promised secrets earlier on. And the secrets are that chocolate's great news. Chocolate is good for you. It's good inside and out. This is what we absolutely adore. In the right quantity and the right sort, we have to, we have to say, don't we? No, I, absolutely. Don't overindulge it. It's the sugar, which is the bad thing, but focus on the other thing. Uh, Dawn, it has been such a delight having you as my guest today. Thank you so much for getting in touch with the show. And uh, we will come back because next time I want to find out a little bit about pairing chocolate with cuisines. And what I might do as a special treat, I might bring all the chocolatiers together for a virtual chocolatier conference. Because I've got people from, just come back from Peru, they can talk about their experience. I've got the world champion in, in Denmark, I've got that sort of side. I've got molders and other bits and pieces. I can get all of you together and we'll have a little virtual chocolate hurrah. Would that be good? That would be lovely. And I think as well, you see, with, with um, chocolate, with anything, when you're tasting, it's a personal thing. So people's palates are different. People like different things. But I think with chocolate, that side of it, um, and, and with wine as well, when you're an, an artisan or when you're, um, you know your product, you can then educate people so they have a choice. So hopefully, I don't, I don't keep saying, oh, my chocolate's the best, my chocolate's the best, because I know there is some fabulous chocolate out there. Well, what I'm trying to do is get out to the public that there's a choice. And if you look on labels, you can actually see you can choose whether you want it full of sugars and, and vegetable oils and actually no chocolate at all because there's a lot of products out there that are sold as chocolate that actually there is no chocolate in it. It's just sweetened vegetable fat. 
So once you start to look at what you're eating and you start to see the ingredients and understand what is needed in chocolate, what isn't, then you can start to try them and you can choose between the different brands, between the different countries of origin, um, the different cocoa levels, and you can start to um, get to know something, but, but at least you've got a choice and you can have an informed choice. Now with that, I love chocolate and know about chocolate. I like wine, I don't know a lot about it. So I'd be really pleased to uh, you know, talk to other chocolatiers with their experiences and other you know, oh, I will bring in Teo Philippe uh, from Corsica as well. We'll talk about chocolate and wine. We can have these sort of combinations. Mm. Uh, people looking for that inspiration for the 7th of July. Um, <laughs> lots of inspiring mm. things in there. But just to finish with then, I mean, the top tips and people, apart from making your own, which is glorious, when people are looking at chocolate bars, you mentioned that you get your chocolate from Belgium and there's certain things. What should they be looking? Because I like the idea of people looking at labels and understanding those. To finish with, just run us through what people should be looking for in a chocolate bar. So very basically, dark chocolate, high levels of cocoa, more than 50%, less than 50%, it can't be called chocolate. So high levels of cocoa, um, or, or as, and try different brands because don't give up on a 60, 70% and say it's too strong. Try a different one, different beans taste differently. Where you've got high cocoa levels, it means you've got less sugar. Um, in all chocolate, nearly all chocolate, you will have two tiny, tiny ingredients and they are the last little ingredients. So they'll be vanilla, whether it's natural or a flavor. Usually in a real chocolate, it's a natural vanilla flavor. Usually about half a percent and a lecithin and emulsifier. And that stops the chocolate from um, becoming too gloopy. It just keeps it in, in a liquid form when it's in its um, melted state. So those are two tiny ingredients. So they will be the tail end of your ingredients list. But with a dark chocolate, certainly you want the first ingredient to be cocoa solids, and then sugar, and then those two little ingredients. Milk with the addition of milk, and you want to see whole milk powder, not necessarily whey powders, skimmed milk powders. Um, and what I'm talking about here is solid chocolate. If you've got fillings in your chocolate, you're going to have different um, oils and different fillings uh, ingredients in those that list but in a solid chocolate you don't need vegetable oils you just want your cocoa solids um, and as I say in a milk chocolate no um, skimmed or whey powders whole milk powder and white chocolate should be made with cocoa butter then it's chocolate because it's come from the cocoa bean so white chocolate is cocoa butter and milk and sugar now once you've got established you've got the right ingredients from your cocoa bean in there as I say, you don't want the dilutants, which are the other milk powders, palm oils, vegetable oils. Uh, flour is a bulking agent, thickening agent. You don't need gluten in chocolate. So those are other things you want to avoid, really. Fantastic. Well, they, this has been such a delight. I'm so, so pleased you came on the show. Dawn, an absolute pleasure. I look forward to welcoming you back again soon. But for now, Dawn Shrives, thank you for joining me. You're welcome, Andrew. Thank you very much. You take care. Bye-bye. So thank you again to Dawn for joining me. If you'd like to come on the show, uh, write to me at guests at octopusTV.com. If you have any comments or want to share any opinions or send your own recipes, you can write to lol, L-O-L, at octopusTV.com. In any event, don't forget to share, to follow, to stalk, all of those in the usual social media platforms. But for now, I've been Andrew Vaughan. You've been great. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.